everybody. Here with Deepak Chopra today. We're talking about his 92nd book about abundance. So we're going to go into all of the ways we can be more abundant, more aware. Anything else? And be joyful. Joy is the only measure of success. All that and more. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we try to do here every single day. Our quote of the day, every time you are tempted to react in the same old way, ask if you want to be a prisoner of the past or a pioneer of the future. I like that, Queen. That's Thank a good one. Thank you. Um, I think that that's from Deepak Chopra, <laughs> <laughs> our guest today. In person, by the way. Very excited to have an in-person guest. I know. Uh, an in-person Deepak. A re- an in-person Deepak. Like, that's the coolest of cool. Um, but um, but I do uh, love this quote because with my somatic uh, work that I'm doing, somatic expression work, one of the things that Brian, um, my therapist, always talks about is new patterns, new behaviors, new things. So like today, I was going to make my breakfast the same old way I make it and, you know, organize my things and make my coffee. So I'm running around the kitchen doing this whole thing. And then I'm like, no, I'm going to go buy my coffee. I'm going to go through drive through and buy my coffee and switch it up. And I'll do the same old, same old. And every day I'm trying to figure out what can I do differently, right? Like I've noticed I got sucked back into checking my phone in the morning and I don't like that. And so I have to break that pattern. And do you know how hard it is? What an addiction to like, oh no, let's just see what's going on in the world. And then you pop into Twitter and you're like, no, it's no, I can't do it. So hard. Right? I am the exact same way and I struggle immensely with it. And I know it affects me so much. Yeah, when it's I a check real it. problem. It's really hard. Be- and so yesterday I just said no. <laughs> ah. I went to my like social media like folder. And I was about to hit Twitter and I said, no, don't do it, Maria. Don't do it. <laughs> and I didn't do it. Look at you. Um, and so it's it's definitely one of those things when you get back in, you know, it's hard to get back out. So I try every day to come up with a new pattern or mm. do things differently or, you know, be spontaneous, right? And so I can create a new future. I'm trying to pioneer my new future. And maybe we'll ask Deepak a little bit more about that um, in our chat today. I like that. This will be our second chat on this show. If you haven't listened to our first episode with Deepak, um, that one was really life-changing for me. Mm -hmm. When he talked about polarity and how we're all things, you know, you can be mean and you can be nice. Like we're always so trying to defend our good sides, but we have our bad sides too. Like mm-hmm. I can be a bitch sometimes, but when I both in, in society we're taught that we're not those, we can't be those things. Right. So we try to like pretend like those moments are just non-existent. Mm. But just see, look at all the times I'm super nice and super generous and kind and all these things. Right? Then we negotiate and all this stuff. And and the truth is, like he said. We can be generous and cheap at the same time, like the, in the same body, in the same spirit, mm-hmm. right? There could be reasons you're cheap and reasons you're generous. And, and so the polarity of that is, is us. And that's just like quantum physics and right. all of that. So it made me feel so much freer to understand myself where, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe that's like the Gemini thing. No, it's just polarity, like we're all things and the the sooner we kind of embrace the fact that we have all these other sides to us, which I think that um, shadow work is something people talk about a lot and we've talked about on the show as well. Um, and, and, you know, that's an explore, exploration of those other sides of us, those darker sides we repress and pretend aren't there and only a few people maybe in our lives get to see it, right? Oh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I talk about this all the time with my mother. I'm like going back to our astrology just because I like to use astrology as my, you know, my sounding board. I'm like, OK, so you're the only person who really gets to see my Scorpio side. Everyone sees my Pisces, my boo, light, ethereal, dreamy, whatever. And then my Scorpio is like dark and go- goes there. But my mom's the only person who sees it. Yeah. And that's honestly something I'm working on, though, because I'm like. Why are you doing that to yourself, Kelsey? Well, it's God, okay how to exhausting it, to put on a show all the time. Oh, right. Like, remember last summer when I tried, I was like yeah. trying to shake you out of it. <laughs> I was like, Kelsey, uh, yeah. 
There are other emotions, yes. and I know you're not a sociopath. Uh-huh. <laughs> there are other emotions in there. Yeah. Let them out. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you see mine all the time. I know. Yeah. It's <laughs> but so... that's why I think you and Kevin are bonded too, because you're both Scorpios. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. His dark side exhausts me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Kevin, so I want to, I know we have um, an astrologer coming on in it another month or so. And I want her to read Kevin's chart because he has a lot of Aquarius too. And Aquarius runs and Aquarius is very like, they put up guards. Anyways, he is a very interesting chart. You know, I don't think Kevin's ever had his chart read. Well, we should do it. Well, I, and I will tell all of you heel squatters that, um, and anyone else who's new and listening, when you get your astrology chart done by someone really good, oh, yeah. um, Sanjeev, who did mine, Rose Theodora, both have been on the show. They were excellent. Um, there was another woman who was unbelievable too. There's so many we've had, but, um, you understand yourself so much better. Everything makes sense as to why you are the way you are. And then you can put words to things, words to the feelings and the instincts in your body. And there's just, again, another release and you're like, Oh, all right, cool. Yeah. I'm not crazy or I'm not right you know, strange or whatever it is that you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I highly, highly recommend that. We should do that with Kevin. He should get that done. I think it'd be fun. And for those of you who maybe like can't find someone or can't, you know, afford it right now, what I love is the pattern. And Mm. I know Maria uses it too. too. So I was really lucky to get Lisa as a friend and she read my chart and I was like, I've I've never felt more seen. Who started the pattern. She's the, thank you. She's the CEO of the pattern app and i yeah had never felt more seen but it hits me daily oh I, they're uh, crazy uh, good uh, uh, like wild so anyways if you don't have the opportunity to get it read get that app yeah it's well here's changing. my thing you want to have someone read it because you have questions and you want to be able to have that back and forth and you want to have that experience and then the pattern is like okay now you know who you are you get it and the pattern just keeps blowing you away. Now, you're right. If you really can't, this is amazing. But if you can eke out, you know, the, that extra money to just have one someone do your whole chart for you, oh, Game it's changer. worth it. Yeah. Agreed. So I would if you can. But with gas prices right now, <laughs> oh my, I don't think that that's uh, feasible because we're spending at least another $250 a month on groceries um, because of inflation. Um, same foods that we've been buying all the time. That's just how it is. And gas is just out of this world. Thank God we don't really go anywhere. Truly. Pooj just showed me a picture of her gas prices yesterday. Seven thirty five. Wait, what? Yeah, I don't know. I, I did, did not I didn't buy any gas from there, but I was yeah, I was across the street. The lowest is seven thirty five, seven sixty five, seven ninety five. Oh uh, my goodness. Yep. It's crazy Wait, but down the street here we're at five something five yeah no there's definitely places that are way less i just saw this and i was like this is actually insane yeah i got some for six yesterday yeah seven i can't like it's almost cuckoo. eight dollars well queen you're in the catbird seat because you get a prius hell yeah so i know tough. it's so funny because everyone's like oh my gosh i'm paying a hundred bucks and i'm like oh well, I used to pay 25 and now I'm paying 40 and I'm still skating by with 40. I know. <laughs> I know. It's I, crazy. I know. I'm really glad my dad back east has the Prius too. Oh yeah. I'm so grateful Kevin bought that when he did. I was, guys, so one day <laughs> I, I see, I get a ring notification from my house in Connecticut and I see a car That's right, I forgot in the driveway <laughs> And I go, oh my God, alert, alert, everyone. There's a burglar, a Prius. He's driving a Prius. <laughs> and it's a he. <laughs> and it's a he. And so I'm making all these alerts and something inside of me is saying, I think Kevin bought a new car and just didn't tell me maybe. So then I start calling him and calling him and calling him. And apparently it was supposed to be a surprise. <laughs> Nothing's a surprise. Yeah. I find out everything. I almost found out he was proposing to me too. Oh my That's God. That's a different story. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so he bought uh, a used Prius um, when we were back East last year for my mom, because there were so many of us and we needed vehicles. Luckily he bought it then because now it's like so challenging to buy a car. And I was reading an article that, The parts are even harder to get now because there's some Russian connection to some palladium or something. So anyway, things are getting a little bit more challenging. So um, 
we're grateful for our electric vehicles Truly. in our homes right now. Truly. That's for sure. All right. Friends, uh, I'm so excited. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, um, we are going to chat with my friend Deepak Chopra about abundance, how to cultivate it, how to bring more of it into your life. He's a best-selling author, doctor, spiritual thinker. He's been treating patients for nearly 50 years, and he's been an advocate for holistic health care for around 30 years. He's written 92 books. 21 of them, New York Times bestsellers. He's the founder of the Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit entity for research on well being and humanitarianism, and Chopra Global, a modern day health company at the intersection of science and spirituality. And he's also a world renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. I am so excited for our conversation with Deepak Chopra. All right, Deepak, 92 books. Holy moly. Where do you get the energy to keep writing? It's really not effortful at all. You know, I ask myself questions before I sleep or meditate. (laughs) Then I get some answers and I write them down. Ends up being a book. So my attitude is, God is writing the books and I'm collecting the royalties. (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) I like it. Do you feel like it's downloaded to you? I do. Yeah. Yeah. And did that happen from the beginning, or was that something that just No, the beginning was actually a bit of a struggle, um, but it wasn't a struggle in the creative way. I was a doctor in Boston, and I was seeing patients, and some would die, and some would recover with the same disease. And I was confused, so I started recording them. And uh, I tried to publish these cases in professional journals, rejected, applied to many publishers, rejected. So finally I self-published it. That was the struggle. But after that, never. Can you explain why you think you were rejected? 30 years ago, what I was saying made intuitive sense, but it wasn't science. Mm -hmm. Now with epigenetics, what we know about the microbiome, we know so much about how the nervous system operates, not only the brain, but the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. There's no experience, in fact, this experience, that doesn't have a brain correlate. So every thought, every emotion, every feeling, every image, every encounter, how you feel, There's a brain correlate, and what happens in the brain happens in the body. It influences how you act in the world. So now we can say there's science. And in the last 30 years, I've also been publishing a lot of science with uh, peer-reviewed journals with other colleagues. So it's mainstream now, what I was saying 30 years ago, and 30 years ago it wasn't, so that's why. I was criticized, vilified, even attacked. Yeah, I I think <clears throat> I'm reading Tony Robbins' Life Force book right now, and what what he says is, I mean, he's able to put into words things that I feel instinctively mm-hmm. and intuitively, like you said, where doctors have really great intentions and they're amazing, and they're some of them are amazing, some maybe not as amazing, <clears throat> but what they're learning kind of expires, I guess, in like a year and a half, two years. You- Especially now with uh, all the technology that we have. You know, in the last two years, during the pandemic, there have been so many discoveries, not just mRNA, but we know so much about how genes repair themselves, what are the molecules that trigger self-regulation, mm-hmm. that cause integration <clears throat> of every experience. So, yeah, la- even last two years, we've made, quantum leaps in the science, genetics, epigenetics. But that doesn't get applied in modern medicine. It takes a while. I mean, I teach medical students now, and they know it. The the current generation of medical students, very much into it. My generation, no. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they say paradigm shifts happen one funeral at a time. Oh. God, that's dark. Um, I think, you know, for, I, I help people go through their brain tumor journeys behind the scenes. I, I 
offer them the cliff notes, let's say, for what we went through with my mom. And one of the things I try to impress on them is that they have to use their own inner guidance and their own intuition. Get as many opinions as you can, feel what feels best for you, and you know your body better than anyone knows their body. Like all of these people have studied, they all know so much. But when you're dealing with a deadly disease, there's a lot of spaghetti being thrown up against the wall. And I've watched that in real time where <clears throat> doctors would come up with a plan and I would create new concoctions. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. My voice is... I have this new inhaler that coats my throat and makes it a nightmare. Mm. Um, they would come up with, you know, this plan, plan A. And I'm like, well, what if we mix this in and take that one thing out. And they're like, well, that could work. Well, what if we did this combination? That could work. That could work. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, well, what about ice cream and donuts? That could work. And that's when I realized, oh, we're really just throwing spaghetti at the wall. So in these kind of circumstances, I always say you have to be your own doctor. Your own advocate. You have to do your research. You have to get, as you said, many opinions. Mm -hmm. And then listen to yourself also. But you have to also keep up to date. I'm at a brain conference right now since you mentioned this. And there are huge advances. Digital therapeutics, you know, vagal stimulation, non-invasive ultrasound therapy, and so many things that mm -hmm. haven't yet <clears throat> reached the public. Uh, but there are amazing innovations happening right now in technology. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing that people don't understand. The medical world, you know, their doctor, their traditional doctor can't suggest any of these things because they're not proven. So the things that you intuitively knew when we're seeing patterns of 30 years ago, you're like, hey, guys, I see something here. And they're like, no, it's not scientifically proven. Well, now all of these people miss out on those benefits when if you're out there doing your own homework and kind of... I say, you know, throwing that, you know, Hail Mary pass and saying, well, let's try this. This There's maybe no harm that can come from this, but something good could come from it. Um, that's what I did with my mom. I tried things. That's right. See, the, the problem is that the scientific research is done by PhDs. They're not doctors. They're doctors, but they're not medical doctors. The medical doctors are good doctors, but they lack the they slowly get the science. Mm -hmm. And so there's a disconnect. And then there's all these government regulations and things that you have to get approved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, two days or three days ago, I did an interview for my YouTube channel. It's called The Chopra Well. And uh, I interviewed a colleague of mine who's uh, one of the top scientists at Harvard. We wrote three books together, Super Brain, Super Genes, The Healing Self. So you can't think he's not a top-notch scientist. And YouTube took the video off. We said, why? Because you said something in that that is not in line with the CDC or with the WHO. So we actually protested and got rejected again. And I think at the other end, there's a robot who's making all the decisions because anybody who knew science would say, these guys didn't say anything inaccurate. It's just cutting edge. Wow. So there's politics, there's bureaucracy, yeah. there's fear. <clears throat> a lot of fear. Fear, lawsuits. That's the other thing I try to explain yeah. to them. You know, when you're in that situation and you have that yeah. nude deadly diagnosis. There's so much fear and the people you're going to trust <laughs> are the ones who are most in fear. Yeah. They are in fear. Yeah. So, okay. This new book, um, is about abundance. One of Kelsey's first questions. You had a question when we were in the, in the office to get today. <laughs> Oh, what yeah. What was your question, Kelsey? My, well, I feel like Deepak, so many people, it's like, okay, I don't have money. I want money. How do I get money? So I said it in a funny way. I said, how do we get wealthier? How do we bring that abundance of wealth in? But I said it funny. So then Maria was making fun of me. <laughs> but the question still pertains. How, like, how? You say that we come from a scarcity mindset and that's why we don't have abundance in our lives. But what about for those people who are like, I need money to live. Yeah. When it is your reality that right. you are 
having a challenge paying your bills. Look at gas prices are exploding. Inflation is killing our supermarket bills. When you are in that place where you don't know if you're going to be able to pay your electricity bill or your be able to buy your groceries. How do you get out of that scarcity mindset and into an abundance mindset so that more can come? And how do you explain that more will come? Yeah, I mean, we can solve this in two minutes, but... We um, have plenty of time, Deepak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, <clears throat> you know, are you at cause or are you at effect? And people who say, I don't have any money, um, just and whatever, scarcity consciousness, they're scared, they're fearful. That self-prophecy recycles. That their, their concern about money actually makes their anxiety about money even more. And I have done some work on research on well-being with Gallup, and uh, it's fascinating. You know, we look at career well-being, purpose well-being, social well-being, um, professional well-being, community well-being, financial well-being, emotional well-being, spiritual well-being. But the number one anxiety that people have, notwithstanding they may be in the midst of a divorce or somebody has died in the family, it doesn't matter. Number one concern is still money. So when I wrote this book, I was actually, I happened to come across a lyric from Bob Marley. And he said, some people are so poor, all they have is money. And, oh. you know, I loved that quote. And I then went and did research on happiness and joy and things like that and abundance. And you may or may not know, but social scientists have something they talk about called the happiness formula. And actually, it's an equation. H is equal to S plus C plus V. H stands for happiness. Is equal to S, set point in the brain. Set point for happiness or unhappiness. And here's how it is created. It creates 50% of your experience every day of happiness comes from your set point in the brain. Uh, mind, brain, same thing. So if you were growing up... Um, in the first three, four, five years of your life in an environment with your parents, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where your parents were always complaining, condemning, criticizing, playing the victim, then you end up being unhappy. Uh, that's unhappy set point. If on the other hand, your parents, and this is very interesting, were always finding opportunities in the midst of adversity, like pandemic uh, created lots of opportunities for Zoom, for mm -hmm. vaccines, you name it. I can name you 25 things that were discovered during the pandemic and how people made money out of it. So people who were looking for opportunities in the midst of ad adversity, but more important, with their child, they paid attention, deep listening, appreciation, and noticing their gifts, affection, real deep caring and love, and acceptance, not trying to change them, these kids grew up to be happy people. Now you say that's bad news, I had nothing to do with it. But the answer is you can change your set point. You know, in the book I talk about how to determine your soul profile. We go through many meditations at seven levels of abundance uh, and rituals, and they're not something I created, they're ancient rituals. But people in the West don't understand them. You know, when mm -hmm. I say Tantra, they take sex. It's not <laughs> that. Tantra is a ritual to trap energy, focus it, and realize intention. And then there are mantras and yantras, and there are techniques that are very well known in the yogic traditions. So anyway, 50% of your experience comes from happiness or unhappiness is what happened in childhood is equal to S plus C, conditions of living, money. And so here's the data. If somebody wins the lottery, they're ecstatic in the beginning. In six months, they plateau. In one year, they're back to their set point. And two years, they're more miserable because now they're worried about parking their money in the Bahamas, they're worried about taxes, <coughs> or all kinds Most of Most of them have lost it by then. Yeah. Most of them have lost it by then, too. Yeah, most of them have lost it. <laughs> Looks what's happening with the oligarchs right, right now in Russia and so on. 
So uh, money is about 10% of you need money. Certainly it's a very important thing. But it's if it's the only thing, if you earned a lot of money and never lost it, did everything, you don't have joy, what's the point? The third part of the happiness formula is the choices we make every day. V, voluntary choices. People make two kinds of choices. One is for personal pleasure. Buy a new phone, or if you're very wealthy, a new yacht, or a Boeing jet, or whatever. Do those choices make you happy? Yeah, but only for a while. Mm -hmm. Then you have to redo the shopping or whatever. And if you have an addictive personality, then you get addicted to pleasure. There's another kind of choice that we can make, and that is uh, called in this research fulfillment. Fulfillment happens when you have meaning and purpose in your life, but even more important, when you make other people happy through those four A's, attention, affection, appreciation, acceptance. Uh, so when I look at that formula, I said, you know, the wisdom traditions had a lot to tell us about abundance, safety, security, love, belongingness, material success, creative expression, insight, intuition, higher vision, transcendence, even they addressed even things like existential unhappiness, you know, getting old, infirmity, death. There's nothing that wasn't covered in these wisdom traditions. So when I wrote the book, that's where I went. And in my tradition, by the way, which is Vedanta and Yoga, <coughs> four goals of life. Dharma, finding your life purpose, following your bliss, number one. Artha, which means uh, money. So you don't have to apologize for making money and being spiritual at the same time. It's actually said by the spiritual tradition I come from, you better make money. Oh, wow. But do it according to your values. You know. So in the book, I create a, a, a questionnaire where people can look at their values by doing something called a soul profile. And if you behave or act or speak or even think based on your values, soul profile, then you attract people in your ecosystem that have the same values. And what is money? It's the exchange of values. You know, if your values are alcohol and guns and weapons and pornography, yeah, you can make money. Settle in Las Vegas and deal with those people. And you make money. But if your values are something different, then that's what will attract you. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, Money is important. It's not the only thing. It, in the context of everything, it becomes a means to fulfillment. It becomes a means to help others. It becomes a means to have a wonderful life and mm -hmm. build a beautiful studio. Yeah. So it was Dharma. Ka oh, there's one more. There's one more, there's yeah. There's Dharma, Artha. Hartha? Artha, A-R-T-H, okay. okay. which That's means the money. wealth, exchange <clears throat> of values to make money. The third is Kama, not Karma, Kama, as in Kama Sutra. But even that's misunderstood. Kama means sensual desire, delight in every experience, yeah, including sexuality, but sensual delight. So when you're mindful in anything, eating, you get sensual delight. Seeing these colors, but mindful, you get sensual delight. We are so distracted, we have no sensual delight. So that's called kama. And the last one is called moksha, freedom from your selfie, because we've sacrificed ourself for your selfie, it means freedom from suffering, freedom from the fear of old age, infirmity and death. And those are the four goals. And that's called liberation. Hmm. Or enlightenment, which is more commonly used here. The thing is, is that I feel like no one's really groomed with any of that. Growing up, it's like survival, you know, be good, do as you're told. And look out <clears throat> for number one. Yeah, and, and do a job that's socially acceptable and will make a lot of money. That's yeah. it. What a tragic time we live in. You know, you, you have a child. Full of wonder, <clears throat> curiosity, joy. And then you kill then it. Then <laughs> you just condition him with the hypnosis of the social mind. And the poor kid is bamboozled into false constructs because by nature, humans are infinitely creative. In fact, if you're innocent, some of the things 
I talk about in the book is how do we return to that place of innocence where everything is delightful. Mm-hmm. Which is what's going to attract the abundance Which will in all areas. Every area. Seek the highest first. Everything else comes. So how do you go back to that? How do you find that when it's been so covered in dirt and dust? Well, as an adult, first of all, you need to be aware that the the world is not the problem. We are the problem because the world is who we are. Actually, the world is who we are both personally and collectively. Right now, the world is war, terrorism, eco-destruction, climate change, destruction of species, On and on, pandemics, mass migrations, violence, cyber warfare. It looks like a prescription for extinction, sleepwalking to Mm -hmm. extinction. So that's the world, and it's a projection of our collective consciousness. But, you know, I can be immune to that if I personally become the change I want to see in the world. And if there's enough people doing that, then the world changes. You know, during the pandemic, and slightly just as the pandemic was starting, or before that, um, our non, uh, our foundation, which is a non-profit, um, I became aware that suicide was the number one cause, not number one, number two cause of death in teens. And that, That was a pandemic across the world. And we weren't doing anything. You know, Japan, they had more deaths from suicide than from COVID-19. So as part of our program, along with other colleagues, uh, a recording artist had died from suicide and a sister was a a film actress. And uh, with another colleague, um, we started a program globally called neveralone.love and what we did was we employed an emotional chatbot AI um, to engage with teens and we found that teens were more comfortable speaking to a machine than to a human being because machines don't judge Mm. and so far in the short while there have been five to seven thousand de-escalations of suicide, 11 million conversations going on right now. Wow. So as the world changes, we see now we're talking about cryptocurrency, blockchain, decentralization. Uh, I think there'll be a revolution where we don't have to depend on special interest groups or so-called authorities. Uh, I find now that when kids get sick, they don't go to doctors. They talk to each other. Uh, teens particularly or young generation 20s and they do their own research and then they consult with each other and then if needed they go quiz the doctor and the doctors are very uncomfortable because these kids know more about themselves or their disease or their illness than the doctor wow i love that <clears throat> that site never alone never alone dot love what a great resource yeah. for people We'll make sure we highlight that, but yeah, I'll tell please you. Please do highlight www.neverlone.love. Yeah. Um, because when you're when you're in a situation where you know someone is, <clears throat> you know, suicidal or having dark thoughts, it's so hard to know where to point them. So I really like that, and I like knowing that it has helped de-escalate yeah, and so in many situations where there's we feel there's a mercy, emergency. At the back end, there are counselors available. So not only we are doing this for teens, but PTSD with veterans, mm. etc. So I'll tell you to the point of the young people healing themselves, Miss Kelsey um, has been dealing with some stomach stuff for the last year and a half since I knew her. And um, I was pushing her to start really taking the helm over her own health care. And she did. And she was one of those people who went to the doctors like, okay, <laughs> got her strength and said, I know what I have. <laughs> because they're all like, we don't know, we don't know. Let's do a million tests, which take a year to do. By the time you're done with all the tests, it's whatever you have is has escalated now and gotten worse and worse and worse, and then becomes maybe even critical. And, you know, she just went in and demanded and figured it out, right? Yeah, well, you know, I'm a doctor, so I know. We use a term in the medical profession. This patient is compliant, meaning they listen to me and they'll do well. And non-compliant patients irritate the heck out of doctors. 
But the data shows that those who actually are non-compliant because they're questioning everything, mm -hmm. they do better. So good for her. Yeah, I, I think that um, it's nice to hear that there is statistics behind that. And I love talking to a real doctor about these things because it's hard. You know, there are, there are so many amazing doctors, but you also have to understand the behind the scenes. They're seeing so many people a day. Yeah, that's right. The they system are working is. so... First of all, these medical institutions are inhumane to doctors. They, I had a doctor who, at a really well-known facility, she's like, oh, I just finished at 11 last night. By the time I got home, it was midnight. I had to be back here at 6 a.m. I'm like, wait, wait, you're a doctor. You need to be healthy in your mind. You need to sleep. You need to be at your best so you can be your best for me. So now that's the, the behind the scenes. And then they also have a million patients. They can't be thinking about you 24 seven and how do I cure Deepak? How do I make sure I've thought of everything for Deepak? They're in your face for the five or 10 minutes they have in front of you. They're thinking of you then, they're trying to come up with a quick solution and figure it out. And then they just refer you to a million people. Yeah, I am a real doctor, but some people think I'm a witch doctor. <laughs> and I've been accused <laughs> of that. So on your point, you know, I remember as a resident, that was a long time ago. Things are slightly better now. But I do remember as a resident earning very little money, $202 every two weeks. So I had to work in the emergency room. We called it moonlighting um, when I was not on call in the hospital. So sometimes 48 hours without sleep. Mm -hmm. I remember distinctly reading a chart in the morning medical records, my handwriting, I had put in a pacemaker, a ventilator, saved a patient's life, and I had no memory. I'd done it in my sleep. Sleepwalking. Yeah. Like, you know, some people sleepwalk and drive. I, that was the major cardiac intervention, Sleep, sleepwalking. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That is, that is the... the the way we were treated. And now it's a little better because people are becoming aware that burnout is the number one uh, cause of depression and suicide amongst physicians, yeah. even amongst psychiatrists. Yeah. And you're seeing, you also know that so many people are misdiagnosed. So many accidents happen. And you'd think that most of these accidents could be happening because there is a lack of sleep. And, and an exhaustion and a burnout. So I always try to just let people know there's so much more going on behind the scenes than you're considering. Mm -hmm. So you do have to do your own homework, but there's a way to do it with doctors. So if you're going to be a non-compliant, be a kind non-compliant. Right. Don't be an asshole. Have, have <laughs> compassion for your doctor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I always say I was a collaborator with my mom's doctors yeah. and and had complete respect for them. But I also knew my patient and I had very good instincts on what would work and what wouldn't work. And, you know, we all did it together. Yeah. I think we need self-compassion, but also compassion for our healers. Yeah. So, um, some of the tools and techniques for attracting this abundance, can you share some of those? They're rituals, mantra, yantra, tantra. So Tantra is the ritual. <clears throat> there are rituals at every level of abundance. And those levels in Eastern traditions are referred to as the chakras. Um, some people are familiar with that word, some are not. But that's an extension of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, a longer version of it. And so you can move from each chakra to the next, combining mantra, yantra is visuals, and then the ritual itself. It's not a mental thing. It's silencing the mind, introducing an intention, and letting your consciousness, not your mind, your awareness, consciousness, spirit, soul, whatever, different words for the same thing, organize the details. Let me give you a metaphor. <clears throat> if I throw a pebble in a still pond, I'll see a ripple. Mm -hmm. And if the pebble is a different shape or a different size, I'll see a different kind of ripple. If I throw the Empire State Building in a turbulent ocean, nothing. So if your mind is turbulent, mm. full of anxiety, fear, anger, resentment, guilt, shame, depression, 
intention doesn't work. You know, the, all these so-called laws of attraction and secret, they deal at the level of the mind. And people are disappointed, to tell you the truth. So the rituals that I introduce in the book, and I didn't invent them, they're ancient, uh, and have worked for me in my life and for many people, you know, in the world. Uh, we are not privy to those. So all my work has been about awareness and consciousness. If you're not aware of something, you can't change it. But once you become aware of it, then there's reflection mm -hmm. and there's insight and there's creativity. How do you know the difference between your mind and your consciousness? Your consciousness is the awareness of your mind. So the awareness of the mind is not the mind. Okay, The awareness of the mind is actually free of the mind. If you can witness your thoughts like little clouds floating across the open sky, you are the open sky, not the clouds. And so you learn to witness not only thought, but emotions, images, sensations, perceptions. And then you also realize that actually every experience is ungraspable. And every experience is actually not even happening now, it's happening in the past. So if I asked you what happened to your childhood, you'd say it's a dream now. What happened to your teen years? Now it's a dream. What happened to yesterday? Now it's a dream. What happened to five minutes ago? Now it's a dream. What happens to these words by the time you hear them and your audience hears them? They don't exist. So we are all the time dealing with illusions. That's the mind. The mind creates stories to validate its own integrity. Awareness of the mind is free of all stories. It's joy, absolutely. So is it <clears throat> that you're out of body? Well, that would be good because there's no one inside the body. You know, when we say out-of-body experiences, the real mystery is there's no one inside the body. If I ask you, where are you? You say, I'm here. Assuming that there's a little Maria looking at the world through these eyes and through the brain, there's no one there. So, you know, when they say the soul or awareness is in the body, it's not true. The body is in awareness. It's the other way around. So when people mm -hmm. talk of out-of-body experiences, they're actually talking about the reality um, in body experiences, but hallucination. Hmm. So when I meditate, sometimes I see. So if someone, if the person I'm doing the meditation says, you know, take a deep breath in through your heart, I see it in front of me, and I thought that that was weird. Yeah, the body already is a projection. See, if I hurt myself here, where's this experience happening? In awareness, if I was not aware, there's no hurt here, right? Mm -hmm. So the pain, the body, the hand, they're all in awareness. And if I can distance myself from the experience in awareness to the awareness itself, I'm free. Now in this room, you know, I ask people, look around you, see what you're looking at. And they will name objects, you know, that thing. That. No one ever names the space. And without the space, you wouldn't know, there wouldn't be any objects. In fact, the objects, if you know science, are made out of space. Everything is made out of space. So what is this space? It's an empty void, according to science. But now science also agrees, Big Bang and all singularity, that everything comes from nothing. Space is your window right now. If I ask you focus on the objects, then become aware of the space. This space has been around eternally. And the space here is the same as the space outside. The space inside here is the same as the space outside. This space also has the deep, dark mystery of time because it's been a witness to all that happened will happen, will ever happen. And the yogis call this the Akashic record or the field of infinite possibilities or mm. uh, something like Chit Akash. And they say, have a relationship with space and everything will be revealed to you. That's one thing oh. I do as a practice. I just got the chills. That's why 
for example, I'm assuming when I was in Amsterdam, I think. Yeah. When I was in Amsterdam, we were in this like square walking around and I stopped and I said, honey, I think people were killed here. Mm -hmm. And I go, no, a lot of people were killed here. And I felt it. And so later we went and did some research and yeah, it was like public hangings were happening there, I guess. But that would make sense if, if space is holding all those memories, right. And they've seen everything. That's why you're aware of those things or you feel them because they're still there because past and future and all of it is the same. This is what the wisdom traditions say. But, you know, science is not there yet. Science is that's the quantum vacuum Mm. from which particles emerge randomly to create this wonderful, beautiful universe, including us. It's kind of, you know, science um, deals with observations without asking who's observing. Yeah, you know, I go to these science con everything. This is an observation. This is an observation. Who who is observing? Where's the observer? Never answered. The observer is right here. So, so we, in a sense, if we're not in our bodies, technically, we're non-local. We can go anywhere. Anywhere. Because another example that's coming up to my head right now. So there are two different things I'm thinking of just to try to give some form to this a little bit. Um, So if I ever do an impersonation of someone, the only way I can truly do it is if I put myself in their body. Correct. And it sounds crazy. And I, but I finally have started talking to some like comedians and they're like, yeah, if I put myself in that person's body and I can see myself through them, I can become them. Yeah. That's, and you know, method actors do that too. Um, They're, doing Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, or Cleopatra, whatever, they actually embody that in the present time, that incarnation. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but the, the story is that when Ben Kingsley played Gandhi, for which he won the Oscar, for one year, he gave up alcohol, cigarettes, became a vegetarian, Ooh. And and even uh, the rumor is that he became celibate. I'm not sure about that. But actually, he embodied the, the persona of Mahatma Gandhi. That way, it was so classically beautiful and well done. Wow. Well, and then I had an experience a couple months ago with my uncle who had COVID and had severe asthma and he couldn't breathe. And they said he was calling my name in the hospital. So I FaceTimed him and I saw him. He was like, can't breathe, can't breathe. He was panicking. So I started praying with him. And then I was like, okay, let me see if I can breathe for him. So I prayed and I said, God, let me be his lungs. Let me use my lungs for him. So I put myself in his body. (laughs) I could see his, his um, hospital gown on top of me. So I was inside and I was breathing with him really deep breaths. And then he was able to breathe and he fell asleep. See, if you told that to a current scientist, he'd say you're nuts. Yeah. But I did actually, it for my husband in prayer the other night. Yeah, he couldn't catch his breath, so I breathed for him intention. too. Prayer is intention. Have a relationship with the space. Imbue in space your intention or prayer and then direct it. That's tantric ritual too. Direct it to the other person. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. I never thought about it like that though, where we are wherever we want to be. You are where your awareness is. If I tell you right now, bring your awareness to your toes. You're there. Yeah. Okay. Now wiggle your toes. You're wiggling something because you're aware of being there. Now this is a simple metaphor, but it's true across the board, across space and time. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you want to remember and transport back to Mexico, I, you know, for me, when I meditate, I like to hear the waves of the beach sometimes to calm me before I start. And so I put myself right back in Mexico on that beach where I was meditating before. And I just feel those energies. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I do those practices with what used to be my home in New Delhi and I can see what's happening. Wow. Okay, so um, there was a seven-step plan for abundance you talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. Will you walk us through that? It's not easy to walk you through that, but the seventh step involves starting with intention, intention at all levels, sensory intention, you know, sight, sound, taste, smell, etc. Then a little bit of information gathering, analysis, but then incubation, Insight, 
in inspiration, implementation, incarnation. It's a death and a resurrection. Death of the old story, birth of a new story. Mm. So is the death and the birth because of the new sensory awareness as well, where you're, yeah, it's yeah, like the, new the, patterns the, and new yeah, behaviors it, are leading to the new future? Yeah, so true creativity is different than innovation. True creativity is not only a new story and the death of an old story, but new way of dealing with relationships, new context, new meaning. And it's not an algorithm. You can't. Pr that's why we call it disruptive. You know, these days people are talking about disruptive technologies, and. Uh, I've also used this in my practice, by the way. When you have difficult patients, I don't know what to do. I'm a specialist. I'm a neuroendocrinologist. So, you know, cardiologists know a lot about heart disease. Endocrinologists know a lot about hormones. Immunologists know a lot about the immune system. They have no idea of poetry or, you know, human longings or unless they're interested, the role of, things like sleep, emotions, um, uh, biological rhythms, but also art and music. So what I started doing was um, a creative collective process. So in, in medical institutions, somebody's sick, they have grand rounds, or when somebody has cancer, they have tumor board. But everybody who comes there is more or less a specialist, or some a lot of generalists too, but not this other thing, art and music and humanities and emotions and just about everybody, healers. And we have shared vision, help this patient. We emotionally and spiritually bond with each other. Maximum diversity of opinion. And then meditate. And then see what comes up. And frequently, same insights will come up. And then that's where that's the answer. creativity is. Wow. That's so inspiring if all health was <laughs> dealt with in that way. See, in medicine, you don't say healing. I used to use that word. And as soon as you see, we don't heal, we practice. Okay. It's a time to move from practicing to healing. And healing is not just technology. It's everything we talk about. Yeah. Yeah. The word healing means wholeness, holy, therefore spiritual. So what is their thought behind practice? That's interesting. No, don't you know? He has a medical practice. It's part of our vocabulary. Yeah. We either treat or we practice. We never heal. In fact, if I say Which heal, continues the you're cycle. considered a fraud. If a medical doctor says I'm a healer, he's a fraud. But the whole purpose is to heal. Of course. Yeah, this is why it's... It, 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 and now, by the way, there's a lot of data that less than 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant, which means they guarantee the disease. So Angelina Jolie had this uh, Baraka gene, mm -hmm. predicts breast cancer, and so she had a preventive mastectomy. Now there's CRISPR and all kinds of things coming for that too. But 95% of even the mutations that cause illness, mutation, everybody knows what a mutation is now, Omicron mutation, mm -hmm. Delta variant and all, it's a mistake in the genetic code or error. 95% of them don't guarantee disease. If you sleep well, manage your stress, mind-body coordination, an anti-inflammatory diet, biological rhythms, emotional stability and settling into awareness, 95% of illness is actually preventable. I have gone on to say the five Ps, preventable, precise, personalized, participatory and process-oriented and frequently reversible. You know, when people told me in my internal medicine years, I changed my diet and my asthma went away or my arthritis went away. I didn't believe them. But now we know, as soon as you put food in your body, mm -hmm. so science also advances. The first thing it interacts with is the microbiome, which is about 2 million extra genes that we have, which are bacterial. 
And if they're unhealthy and inflamed, then your human genes get inflamed and your body gets inflamed. Inflammation, depression, anxiety go together. 80% of the serotonin in your body comes from your gut. And our foundation, we work with a nutritional psychiatrist, Uma Naidu from Harvard. And, you know, we find that just changing people's diet by understanding their microbiome can alleviate depression, anxiety, cause weight loss, and much, much more. You are what you eat. Yes, and how you eat, mindfully. Mm, yeah. Deepak, I could have you here forever. Um, thank you so much for all that you shared and and all of the um, nuggets that are going to stay with us. And I love... Um, I love our new resources. We're going to put them in the summary of this episode for you guys as well. And um, we'll all be more aware. Thank you. We can <laughs> only change that which you're aware of. I love it. Uh, you guys can get the book Abundance, The Inner Path to Wealth. Uh, go to DeepakChopra.com and we'll put everything in the summary of this episode. Thank you so much Thank as you, always. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Thank you. All right. I mean, amazing as usual. Always. Like, the thing with Deepak, I feel like, is I don't know where this stuff comes from. When he says stuff, I'm just like, uh, he's on a whole other planet. Well, th there's years of research, study. It's wild. Wisdom. Yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> so much in there. Um, I'm always grateful. It was so awesome to have him here in studio, too. Such Again. The book is called, or the latest, the 92nd book is called <laughs> Abundance, The Inner Path to Wealth. Um, and you can find out more at www.deepakchopra.com. We'll put links to that and his Instagram and all of it in the summary of this episode. Uh, and in the meantime, if you haven't listened to our first episode with Deepak, we'll put a link at that in the summary here because I think you'll really, really love it. And it will really help you um, like it helped me and all of us who listened. Uh, be nice people, make good choice. Before Maria, I think we should tell them if you guys, if something spoke to you, comment below on the YouTube video. Thank you, Queen. You're welcome. Yes, if something spoke to you, please leave a comment below uh, and let us know. And in the meantime, be nice people, make good choices and be present.